we get started, do you guys have any questions, concerns, or comments? I know there's like lots of questions being asked, so yeah. it'd be nice if you guys could re-ask some of those questions, because I'm pretty sure a lot of teams have similar issues. You could possibly do that. Uh, yeah, there's a possibility. So one team that I saw that did it upside down, um, they can actually, you could, what you do is you, you pretty much um, flip over. Uh, so this is a software issue that you, that you have to fix, but you swap over the left encoder is equal to the right motor, right motor is well, equal to the left no, encoder. No, you can't do that. No, you, well, you there's a ground. Yeah, but you cross it over like. OK, yeah. Like, I'll show you okay. after. But, um, Oh, OK, I see what he's saying. You yeah, can. You, you can. Uh, they're set up right now if they're like you know in the right position. But if you flip them, you can actually connect it to the other uh, yeah. encoder pins. And then you just have to flip that in your code. That's all. I think it'd be easier if I just showed you right now. So you know how they're <laughs> on your PCB itself, there's like two um, sets of holes, like six holes each, five, six. Three, four, five, six, something like this on your PCB. Um, so the left encoder, it's designed so that the, the pins are facing like nearest to the encoder and they just go straight like this, right? If you want to flip it upside down, you have to jump this wire all the way to this side. Um, yeah. And you just cross it essentially. Or you can just use 24 gauge wire and it should be a lot easier. It's yeah. Like the thinnest wire you can find. Yeah, but not not the thin, not, not that thin one. That was too thin. Like twenty four gauge, we can actually measure out the gauge of the wire. Um, yes. It should work. It's just like um, you have to be very careful that it's completely uh, flat against the PCB yeah. and not popping up. I used like twenty gauge, and it, you just have to like squish it down with screwdrivers, but it still works. The other thing um, we'd like to mention is that you need to make sure that your batteries are charged when you're using it. I've seen teams that use completely dead batteries, and that pretty much destroys y your battery from being able to recharge again, and your mouse doesn't work, when, or your rat doesn't work when the battery's not charged. If you guys uh, want to learn how to use the power supply, talk to one of the officers, um, and that will help you actually in the long uh, run when you do a lot of debugging. You want a constant source rather than having to wait for your batteries to recharge again. Um, that's how you do testing and stuff. Yeah. How long do we generally expect our batteries to last? Um, so to last quite a while. Uh, it should be at least last, like, if you go into the lab, tw two, two days at least. Uh, those are pretty big batteries. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can do, like, like, how much current are you drawing at a time. It's probably less than an amp or something like that, right? Um, and you know C yeah. value and all that. Just to, to take a quick survey, how many people have at least one battery that, it, that is dead? Yeah. Who has a battery that... Who has a dead battery? Like, it doesn't work anymore. Yeah, it won't recharge anymore. Because we might order more batteries soon. So if you have a dead battery, come to us. We'll write you down. Uh, we just need to kind of take that to, to account. Yeah. By dead, we mean like you can't recharge it, not that it's, you've not, used it. Yeah. <laughs> OK. All right, um, that's good. You go next slide, actually. Yeah, just some other things. Um, also, mouse assignments, you guys need to get those in. Only like maybe a little bit more than half the teams actually submitted their first mouse assignment. Um, those are just as important as the rat because the rat this year is easier so that you're able to work on the mouse in parallel. Um, and I know that like learning ego and then following this schematic and uh, writing the bill of materials is a lot of work. And that's why this week we give you uh, like pretty much a week extension until this Saturday. But in the future, if you guys don't turn those in on time, it's just as considered as bad as not completing your rat. So yeah. otherwise, you guys are just blindly connecting these pins and putting them in, and that you really gain nothing out of that. The the idea behind doing the schematic in parallel is so that you actually understand what's going on uh, in the rat, and then apply that to the mouse. And if you have any questions, design is supposed to be open ended, right? So it's your mouse. You want to say that you've decided all these components for yourself rather than you know, just using the recommended parts. Um, and if it's too open-ended, ask us questions, and we're more than willing to help you with that. So for internally, we just update our folder and you guys can see. 
Yeah. Um, put yeah. your schematic, put, uh, update the bill of materials, and. And I, when I go online, I found a value like 800 MAH. Yeah. It is overkill, but it's not bad, right? If you don't draw that much. It's like only like 50 grams, so it's not that yeah, so if it's if you think that's okay, if you can find a cheaper one that has like lower specs. It's not like three point seven. This is the whole pack like seven point four. For the entire battery. Yeah. Eight hundred milliamps. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you think that's reasonable, and I, from what you say, it seems pretty reasonable, then you can use that one. The limiting thing right now is probably gonna, going to be your motors, how fast you're going to drive your motors. Uh, and chances are, when we actually get to competition, you're not going to be running those at full, full power. So just because your mouse is probably not going to be able to go fast enough to do that. But just keep that in mind. So what do you think should be the maximum amp we should be use? No more than like an amp. Like for your motors, if they spin at max speed, assuming you're not stalling the motors. They won't draw more than an amp, an amp and a half. So I mean, tw 40 C is overkill. Anything like 15 C is well above. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So it's, it, that's actually probably the same batteries we used last year. So, um, other than that, keep the lab clean. I think you guys are doing pretty good. Um, every single time I see one of you guys work and clean up. So um, just a reminder. Also, a quick note. Uh, I just added. Uh, a new sheet into the resources page with suggested parts. So that's, those are parts that we've used in the past for the mouse. Um, and then kind of get like an idea of what you're looking for when you design your own. Um, you can take those parts if you want, but we suggest that you look elsewhere too. Yeah. Or at least understand why you picked those parts that we recommended you. Um, OK, if there's no more other questions, we can just go straight to lecture. OK. So, um, you got it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's dirty lab. Dirty lab. Clean, Clean lab. lab. Try to keep it like that. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. So, um, is there a slide before this? Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, so just a brief overview of what today's lecture it's mostly software. Um, and just, like, I guess in the future, um, you don't really have a rat assignment this week, and you really don't have a mouse assignment this week. So use this week to study for midterms or catch up, um, whatever you guys haven't done yet. So a lot of teams haven't submitted mouse. This is the week for you guys to catch up. Else we're going to drop you after fifth week if you guys don't have everything caught up. Um, other than that, this week we're going to go over interrupts and uh, PID. So, um, so a lot of you guys have started programming your encoders, right? Um, how, what does that code look like for those of you that started? Yeah, sure. I mean, what is it? Does it like how are you just briefly describe how it looks like? Do you have like while loops and like the you have like the digital and the real life thing that we're reading from? Mm-hmm. And like you make it like you did like but we only like worked on the motor. Yeah. So something similar to this, right? Yeah. You have two digital in pins, um, you declare your pins. Yeah. Uh, uh, you have a count of the encoder, right? And then I have max encoder count because you obviously don't want to count to int max. Um, and then inside your main while loop, essentially you uh, pull uh, if those pins are high. And if they're high, you increment the count, right? Um, what problems do you guys see with this type of system, or this type of code, do you guys think? So I'm going to give you a hint. Uh, next slide. Right. Read the comment. All right. It says something. Do something that time that's time dependent. What happens? So the counts gets too many. Or. Oh, like it gets stuck in that loop. You can continue over, right? Uh, close. If you do, yeah. Essentially, if this do something is really long, you won't be pulling the encoders until the entire main loop finishes, right? So what's the issue with that? Exactly, right? Encoders, how, how often do encoders uh, pull to you, or pulse to you? Yeah, pretty yeah. often, right? If it's 100 to 1 ratio, every single spin gets you like, what, 50, 60 pulses? You're going to get like a, like a couple hundred every single full rotation, right? But with this code, 
especially if this time dependent thing is really long. You're not you're gonna miss some of those counts, right? What happens if you miss encoder counts? Yeah, you don't know where your mouse is, right? Because that number doesn't truly reflect how many encoder spins, right? Um, so, can anyone think of like a solution to this? Yeah. Can you like hook up an external clock? External clock. Like what do you mean? The, I forgot the, what the part's called, but it has a, a timer. Oh yeah, a, that is actually um, a solution. But um, can you think of a software solution? I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, that 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 is actually a solution that is better than the one we're going to provide you. Um, but you can use external, uh, you can use an external timer that's on the MCU. Um, we'll actually talk about this in lecture six about the MCU. Um, but um, are you guys familiar with uh, interrupts by any chance? Yeah. yeah. Do you guys do you want to kind of explain what it is? It's like all oh, this thing has happened, so I'm gonna stop everything else I'm doing and I'm just stuff. Exactly right. That's what you guys want, right? Every single time the encoder pulses to you a high or a low you want to interrupt the system and increment the count to guarantee that every single time the encoder triggers, you get that number and increment it, right? Um, so how we do that is using interrupts, right? Okay. So like I, I already mentioned this, but pretty much interrupts are events that you, um, are, are just routines or functions that you always want to be running whenever an event is triggered, right? And this event can be anything from oh, you divide by zero, or oh, um, your encoder's ticks, right? Um, and you want to be able to program this um, into your code. Um, so just some terminology, uh, that function that you always call every single time an event occurs is called an interrupt service routine, or an ISR. Um, and pretty much the main loop is interrupted, um, and whatever happens gets dropped in order for you to run this interrupt code, right? So um, I guess just to brainstorm, right? So what's this is kind of nice, right? We, we provide you a way to run a routine whenever an event occurs, no matter what's running right now, right? What problems do you foresee when that, if you do something like that? Uh, say that again? Our, the encoder provides the event, right? Um, and then the event, once the event is triggered, there's an event handler or um, an interrupt handler um, that will always run, right? So um, no matter what code is running at that point, the interrupt handler will have priority and run first. What are some issues that you might foresee? Um, After that, it will be turned back to the same. Yeah, it will. Um, that's the idea of an interrupt, is that it, it gets injected. All right, there's normal code flow, right? It jumps to the interrupt. Once the interrupt finishes, it jumps back, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's, that's one issue, right? Um, if you have multiple interrupts going on, right? So which one goes first? Um, so um, depending on, um, we just say right now, most of the time that doesn't really occur uh, if you program this correctly. But for example, reset is an interrupt, right? Um, when you have a reset interrupt uh, event occurring and also an encoder event occurring, which one gets handled first, right? So interrupts have uh, a notion of um, priority, right? So you can actually program this priority into the interrupts. Um, and based on how important this uh, interrupt code runs uh, it is to your um, system, which is your mouse, uh, you might set it to higher priority or lower priority. Um, but um, for most software interrupts, uh, though, that you write, the recommended thing that you do is that you turn off interrupts, right? So interrupts is like um, something that's built into the MCU. If you turn it off when your interrupt code is running, it guarantees that no other interrupts can jump in and uh, preempt your code, essentially. Am I going too fast, by the way, about this? Maybe not. So, okay. Um, what you're doing is you have an encoder running, but every time some kind of event happens, the event handler is going to jump in and interrupt, and perhaps you have a task. Yeah. Okay. So you, you decide what that task is. I see. But in that task, if I move the wheel, then the encoder is going to lose the track of count, right? Right. So that's why you don't, um, the idea is that, OK, before, what we did was we had a, a count, all right, that counts the pulses of, from the encoder, right? The issue is that we ch how we check that count is pretty much checking the signal from the encoders, whether it's high or low. But the issue is, when do we actually check those whether it's high or low? It's in the main loop, right? So if you're inside the code um, somewhere else that's not checking uh, during that time, that encoder raises the uh, signal up, you won't be able to detect that, that pulse, right? But with this interrupt uh, signal, 
pretty much it guarantees that when this uh, inter uh, when the encoder raises the signal up, right, um, whatever code was running before, whether you're pulling it or not, it will just stop right away, and then you just increment the count. Um, I think it makes more sense if I show you the previous slide. This one, right? Here is the signal coming in from the encoders, encoder left A or encoder left B for the two channels. Right now, we're doing an if. If this is high, right? So if it turned and it's a high, um, then we increment, or actually, that should be a, yeah, you increment the count, right? That's, um, that's something that you might have written um, if you didn't use interrupts, right? The issue with that is if this code was really long, while you're running this section of code, um, the encoders might uh, have a send in a signal, a high signal, right? But you can't check it because it didn't occur, which means that you miss counts. If you miss counts, your mouse it no, doesn't, no longer knows where it is exactly. Right? So the idea of interrupts is, say you're running this code, right? your encoder sends in a signal, um, it triggers an interrupt, in which case the interrupt will look for the interrupt handler. Right? That interrupt handler might do something like increment that count. Right? So now you guarantee that every single time the encoder uh, sends in a signal, you increment the count. <laughs> is that? <laughs> OK, um, I think I, I might be overcomplicating this. Um, Think of interrupts as events, right? It can be any event from, from the encoders raising a signal high, or maybe um, you read a certain value, um, or uh, the reset button is an interrupt, right? It's a like when you press the button, there's a high voltage in the reset, right? Interrupts, um, if, you program, if you use these interrupts, um, you can attach a handler to it, right? The handler is a piece of code that will run at any time asynchronously um, when the event occurs, right? So whenever the encoder um, pulses a signal, um, this encoder or this handler for that uh, interrupt gets run, which guarantees that every single time you have a pulse, this code gets run. This code can do whatever you want, right? Um, in this case, it makes sense for you to incre uh, increment the count, right? Because you want to know how many pulses you've read um, if you use that number. And also, this is really dangerous. Uh, this is why you don't want to put waits in your interrupt, because if you wait too long, you're going to try to call another interrupt, and another interrupt. Uh, so try not to put waits, or try and try to keep your code in there really, really short. Yeah. Okay. So I think this actually might make more sense to you guys once we go through the example. <laughs> um, yeah. So like this is just um, like the high level idea of what an interrupt is, right? Some characteristic caveats about the uh, interrupt routine, right? So what you should do for your function. Um, one, it takes no arguments. Um, if you guys are familiar with, uh, have you guys taken CS33 or um, are currently taking it? Um, you guys know what, the idea of like stacks at all? Like a function stack? Call? OK. Um, I think it used to be simpler just to say uh, it, it can't take any arguments in this function, right? Um, it should not return any values, right? Um, those two are because those values are, that you return are those parameters that you pass in. Where should they go, right? Um, for normal function calls, it's stored on uh, a data structure called the stack. Um, that's all you really need to know about that. But this is a special piece of code that gets run, so you don't know where that is stored. Um, it should not be called directly, this function, right? You should be attaching this function to an interrupt, um, which is the event that I was talking about. Um, and then it should in, uh, disable and in, re-enable the interrupt. Um, uh, that's part of the MCU, right? Because you don't want interrupts interrupting each other, right? Because then yeah, your system gets left in like a, a state that you don't know. Um, OK. I think that's. OK, so this is kind of like the list of events that can trigger an inter interrupt, right? Um, there's some software interrupts, for example, um, like, oh, uh, I'm not sure if you guys know. OK. Um, it can be triggered by like an explicit software instruction. Like for example, if you program like a certain variable to be equal to value, it would trigger an interrupt that, that could occur. Um, most errors are, are are system interrupts, right? Like if you're trying to read somewhere in memory that doesn't exist, then that's an error. Um, but then there are also hardware interrupts, right? So like we kind of mentioned buttons. Um, when you click a keyboard stroke, um, that's an, that sends an interrupt to your computer. Um, the one that you're probably going to be interested in for your encoder is rising and falling edges, right? So whenever your encoder sends a rising signal, right, so from low to high, you want to count, uh, increment the count, right? Or whenever it goes from high to low, 
um, you also want to run your ISR at that point. Okay. Is this too fast still? Or next, the next one's an example, so this will actually help you a lot because um, your code might look like that. Okay. Okay. So this is an example where we use encoders with interrupts. Okay. Okay. So we already know a lot about encoders, right? Encoders essentially provide a pulse whenever um, the wheel has rotated or the axle has rotated a certain amount, right? Um, each of these pulses from the ch two channels A and B can have an interrupt attached to it, right? Um, by attaching an interrupt, we can listen for certain events like, for example, rising and falling edges, right? So we attach for A and B. When A is rising, um, we can see that that's one, that's one pulse, um, or one, you can increment your encoder uh, tick count, right? Or when B is rising, um, you can increment it by a count. A is falling, increment it by a count. B is falling, incre uh, increment it by a count, right? So you have Four, t uh, four ticks within uh, those uh, four, yeah, signals. And when you say rising and falling, is that like just changing from zero to one? Yeah, zero to one. Okay, so actually this that kind of brings up a question, right? So why don't we attach an interrupt uh, signal where uh, we pull the, or um, we attach, instead of rising and falling, we attach high and low, right? Why don't I attach, okay, when A is high, run my encoder count, or when B is high, run my encoder, uh, uh, my ISR. Yeah, right. There's no guarantee how many times that interrupt gets run. Um, so rising only occurs once every single pulse, right? But this high depends on how fast your clock is. You, your, your, your ISR can run multiple times within one high signal, right? Um, yeah. So what does that actually look like in code, right? So this is actually the embed, how you use interrupts in embed. Um, you, have, you define two interrupts, right? And this is online if you guys want to, or this is going to be on the lecture, so you guys can just look at it later on. But um, so you see right there, there are two channels, uh, PA2, PA3. So those are the two pins from coming from the encoders, right, um, for two channels. Um, you, you attach the interrupt to those pins, right, um, using interrupt in, channel A uh, is to that pin, channel B is to that pin. Um, then you have, uh, what we're interested in is the amount of pulses that you count. Uh, whenever your wheel rotates, right? Um, and then here is your, IS, uh, your ISR, right? This code doesn't have, takes in the parameter. It doesn't return any values. All it does is it uh, increments the count of the global variable, right? So the idea is that you want to run this piece of code every single time an event is triggered um, by those two pins, right? Um, and here in the main loop, before your main, uh, before your while loop, um, you're attaching events to that, um, or you're attaching um, a certain event um, or an ISR to a certain event, right? The ISR is just the function pointer, right? Um, and this is the event, right? So channel A is, you know, the channel A of the encoder. Whenever it rises, run this function. Um, same thing, whenever it falls, run this function. Um, and same thing for B, right? Yeah. Um, so, okay, should I, let me think. Are you guys familiar with, like, um, where uh, variables are stored in memory, like behind the scenes kind of. Like a lot of variables, like local variables are stored on the stack. Um, global variables have a certain section of memory, right? Um, what C and C++ likes to do um, during compilation is if a variable doesn't get used, like for example, right here, volatile, or doesn't get changed, right? So in here, in your main loop, this, this pulses thing never gets, um, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't change, right? Um, because the C and C++ compiler sees that this variable never changes, and the optimization that it likes to do is just plug in zero whenever this uh, variable gets referenced, right? Because if it doesn't change, we can safely just plug in zero to all those numbers, right? Um, because they don't, it doesn't see that this uh, um, encoder code or this uh, interrupt code gets run in the main routine. Uh, it assumes that it never changes. And because it assumes it never changes, um, it will just replace um, any references to that variable with zero. What Volatile does is guarantees you that every single time you reference this variable, it actually goes into memory and looks at um, the pulses variable and whatever value is there, um, it'll use rather than optimizing it to zero. Um, yeah, uh, so that's what your encoder code might look like, right? Um, do you guys have any questions so far about 
how you might program this. Yeah. What is the serial? Serial communications uh, is enabled on. Yeah, that's your TX and RX. Uh, so you guys will have to do this for this coming uh, assignment, actually. You have to serial read from the, the nucleo. So you can actually print out, like, um, so you guys are familiar what serial communication is? Um, think of it as just like a, a protocol uh, for you to communicate with the MCU, right? So um, serial protocol uh, has two lines, in and out, essentially. Um, yeah, transmit yeah. and receive. Yeah, transmit and receive, so RX and TX, right? So on your computer, you all, you all, if you plug into USB, right, it'll use the two lines um, to talk to your MCU. Um, with RX and TX, serial communication, you have to agree on a clock, a clock rate. Um, you, pretty much that clock determines um, uh, how the communication looks like between your computer and um, your MCU. Um, TLDR, you use serial to pretty much debug and read values from your computer. And you can even use it to write back to the MCU if you want to program that. Okay, if there's no question about interrupts, uh, we're going to continue. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit uh, something that's, I think, a little bit more interesting, right? PID control, right? So last week, we kind of alluded to the fact that um, your mouse isn't perfect, right? So you use all these sensors, these input sensors, to provide feedback for, for your mouse, right? Like, for example, you have encoders to make sure that your wheel has spun a certain amount, right? So you can tell how far you've traveled, right? You have IR LEDs, right, um, to tell you how far you are from the walls, right? Um, and using those data, right, how do you adjust yourself back to the correct path, right? Like if you're traveling down a straight path and you, your, your mouse starts uh, drifting towards the left, right, um, you can read from your IR LEDs um, that, one, um, that you're getting farther away from one wall than the other, right? Um, but what does that actually look like in software, right? Um, and so um, that's what we're going to talk about today, which is PID control, right? So using all these values, how can you use the air um, in order to fix yourself uh, um, away uh, towards the steady correct state, right? Yeah, how do you actually use the measurements you're getting from your encoders, your gyro, and your IRR, and how that actually plays a role in ma making you go straight? If you guys did not car, you guys are very familiar with this. All right. So... PID um, composes of three components. Um, there's a pro uh, proportional, there's integral, and then there's derivative, right? So uh, I should ask this first, right? How would you guys solve um, the drifting problem, right? If I, I gave you two sensors, right, that's reading values, right, and you, you know the expected values of both are zero, um, but one starts reading one and one starts reading negative one, right? Um, you, you know that you're drifting towards one way, right? How, sh how should you uh, uh, compensate for that in software? Yeah. Well, basically, you just run this loop where it continuously reads, and as that gets closer, you just increase the RPM of the motor on that side to turn. Exactly, right? Um, pretty much the further you drift away from what you're expecting, um, the faster you might be wanting to spin the other wheel to compensate, right? Um, so that's, that's literally uh, what proportional controller does, right? Um, the idea is that there's some correction value, right? So correction value, you might translate that to spinning one wheel a little bit faster than the other, right? The larger the correction value, the larger you want to spin one wheel, right? Um, as equal to the error, right? So you can detect this error by, like, for example, the differences between your IR readings, right? If they, you expect them to be the same, but one is smaller than the other, the bigger that difference, the bigger your error, right? <coughs> Times some coefficient, which we call KP, or the proportional coefficient, right? Uh, from that, you can return the co correction. Um, and based on how large the correction is, you spin, how uh, you spin one wheel a little bit more than the other. You guys kind of follow what proportional is? It's literally proportional to your error. Um, follow so far? So like, for example, your micro mouse, right? What would, be the, what would be the error in this case? Yeah, right. You want, you, want, you want your mouse to be center of the cell, right, between two walls, right? So the error would be, like, the difference between your readings on, on either side, right? So what would be the correction? Uh, you already said this. It's going to be spinning one wheel faster, right? Um, so can anyone foresee the issue of this? Yeah, oscillation, right? 
um, essentially, as you're moving closer uh, and your error is, are, is decreasing, right? This does kind of compensate for that by decreasing the error, but you don't slow down towards it, which means that you might overshoot, right? So we actually will see that. Right, so by the way, this is, these graphs are credited to Arvin. He was a past MicroMouse lead. He did this all in, I think, MATLAB, right? So. Um, so yeah, so what we want, right, is something like, um, say you're, you're at zero and your aim is at, at um, one, right? Your target value is at one. Um, as time approaches, you want to uh, pretty much go towards that, uh, that goal and then slow down, right? But with just P, it looks something like this, right? Yeah. You overshoot, but then um, because you don't overshoot by that much, um, you start going down and you, s you oscillate slowly towards the uh, uh, convergence, right? So, um, which means that it takes actually a longer time for you to actually reach that steady state, right? Yeah, I think the point here was instead of uh, asymptotically approaching your, your target value, you see the, the bottom takes you about 25 seconds to sort of reach that line. But in this case, it takes you way less than two seconds. But you oscillate. Yeah. And you overshoot. Yeah. Also, there's the, the second graph. It doesn't even reach one. It oscillates around the point other than one. Yeah. That's why we have to use integral properly. Yeah, he actually got exactly. it. Um, so we'll actually talk about that really soon. <laughs> All right. Actually, before that, we'll talk about derivative controller, right? So we're going to try to solve the oscillation problem first before we try to solve that steady state error that you mentioned, right? So um, <coughs> derivative controller, right? That's pretty much uh, intuitive. You guys all know what derivatives are? Yeah, I hope. <laughs> all right. Um, pretty much as your, ch uh, as your error is changing, right, um, you want to decrease that correction value um, based on how fast this error va uh, value is changing, right? If you're changing the error uh, really fast, right, um, it means that your, your, your proportional uh, controller is, is doing its job, right? It's correcting that error really fast, right? But as you're going tor closer towards that line, um, you realize that you don't have to, you know, be as aggressive about the, uh, the uh, correction, right? Because you're almost there. So you won't, at that point, you might want to slow down, right? Um, so you want to change that correction value to lower it, right? So how would you do this? Um, right? We're going to go back to the original graph really fast. Like right here, right? So you're traveling. You have this giant error, right? So um, at that point, your correction, or your error is really large, right? So your correction is really large, right? So um, like a, a split second later, you're right here, right? You can see that your error has changed significantly, um, in which case your P is doing its job, right? Um, but as you're going closer, right? This, this error changing uh, should be a, is a lot less, right? Essentially, you're getting closer to the answer, but um, your P is still acting um, pretty heavily, so your correction value is still pretty large. Um, the issue with that is that you start to overshoot, right? So um, the idea of, of D is pretty much taking that change in, in error, like how much you fix um, from the steady state, and if that's not very large, you should decrease your correction value because you're getting closer to the answer. Does that kind of make sense? It literally means derivative, right? You take the derivative of the change in, in error that you have, right? Mm -hmm. If that's really large, you're doing correctly, right? But if it's smaller, right, you want to slow down or decrease your correction value, right? And you kind of see that in code, right? Here's your derivative controller, right? You store the previous error, right? You take the difference between the error, right? So you have the change in error, right? And now you have uh, a change in time, right? From the change in error divided by change in time, you can get the derivative of change in error, right? Um, Pretty much, uh, you have the initial correction, right, which is stored by, which is uh, computed by your proportional error, um, and then you t you take this um, derivative error away from that, right, because um, the larger your change, right, does that kind of make sense to you guys? And you can also see why this won't fix the drift problem if you're if you're not approaching that line, then then you won't eventually reach there because you're. Your error will be constant, so your change in error is also constant, zero. Yeah. So what you're fixing with the proportional controller with the derivative controller is 
the fact that you oscillate, right? Because now it accounts yeah. for how fast your error is being fixed for and slows down this correction value that you return um, um, based on how fast you're changing, right? If you're changing really slowly, that means you're closer towards the answer, in which case you should you know, slow down how, uh, how aggressively you are compensating for um, your error, right? But this doesn't account for the steady state error that he was talking about. Um, if you look at, back at the original graph, um, uh, actually, not this one. Yeah, actually, yeah, this, this one. Yeah. Okay. You can see that um, your, your target value is 1, right? You oscillate around this value, but you're still wrong compared to the actual value 1, right? So that doesn't fix for this steady state error, right? You're away from the, um, from the correct value, but um, you're not exactly at that value yet. And D doesn't solve that. D only stabilizes your correction so yeah. that it doesn't oscillate. It just dampens the oscillation. Yeah. Yeah. So you change the correction value when you realize that your um, error is getting like, last, or change in error is getting la less uh, fast, right? Mm -hmm. but how would that work when like, you're changing the correction? I mean, <coughs> actually, let me rephrase that question. OK. Mm -hmm. And it's right now fixed, right? And that through, through that correction value, you get how fast your error is changing. Mm -hmm. But that uh, rate of change of error is controlling the correction value. <coughs> so if it's in a loop, how is that gonna? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a feedback. It's a closed feedback system, right? So, um, I mean, that's the idea of controls, right? Like that, you read some values, you do some actions. That action changes the result, right? And, you, and that result is essentially self-propagates itself. So yeah, you're right. It's a closed loop. Um, but it's closed loop within time, right? So the next time you check, or the next time you run this code, uh, it'll be a completely different values. So I mean, let's say your correction value is 3, for instance. Yeah. Like your difference in error, like the rate is like 2, for instance. Mm -hmm. That correction value is this is is this the sum of your um, of your uh, proportional uh, error proportional and, and yeah oh, both yeah yeah okay so I, I should have been more clear about this PID has some correction value right that correction value determines what you should do for your system right if it's negative you might spin one wheel larger if it's lo if it's positive spin the other wheel really large right this correction value is composed of three main of, of three controllers right the proportional controller depends on the distance away from the actual answer, right? The uh, derivative controller uh, depends on the rate in which you're approaching that answer, right? Um, and those two work against each other, right? So it's actually going to be p minus d, right? Um, because as p, um, p is the positive reinforcement, right? d is kind of like slowing yourself down, right? So that's why it's minus, right? Um, so it's gonna, it's, so far, it's p minus d equals to correction, right? Does that, you guys follow that so far? No, you're calculating an error from your proportional, and then you're all, at the same time you're also calculating from that same measurement. You're also calculating derivative, and then you'll also calculate integral too, all at the same time, and then you just add them all up. And this is kind of like theoretical at this point, right? Like yeah. we're talking about controls, but uh, in reality, you know, this error is going to be your distance from the walls and stuff like that, right? So. Um, it might be a little difficult to actually implement, but um, we kind of want you guys to understand the idea um, more solidly before we talk about the code itself. And uh, to get the correct value, we should like read it in correct interval, right? Like you cannot like when you talk about if you run earlier, so if the program run too long, we have like basic uh, distance from the walls period. Yeah, you'll see that um, you will be running this pulling the walls and then uh, 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 computing this PID value um, in, in an interrupt. Um, so it does guarantee that it will run. Um, and sometimes you can reset your PID. Yeah. Control. OK, so right. going back to that steady state error, right? So how do we actually solve this steady state? <coughs> so the last one. Oh, yeah, so this is kind of like the graph of the idea of with the derivative controller inside. Right? So before it was an oscillations issue, right? 
now we only have a single oscillation. It converges towards the answer right away, right? But you still see that it's off from the actual value that you're targeting, which is 1. Right. So um, actually, let me ask you this. Right? right there, you have an error that exists. Right? Why do you think that, what happened to the p at that point? Yeah, the proportional controller, right? So you, there's an error, right? So the proportional controller um, will return a correction value that's larger than zero, right? You're, you're getting towards the right direction. Um, sometimes the error is too small and you can't detect it, right? Um, but in that case, why would you be increasing your integral error, right, if you can't detect it? What, what's, what's the correction value at this point? Or, or I guess the correction value, um, it's, 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 it's a constant error. value, right? Right. So your correction error at that point is a constant value because your distance, your error, is the same thing throughout, right? Um, at that point, the state is stable, right? Um, what does that mean then? Are you still going in the proportional loop, right? But um, because your error is, is constant, so is your proportional uh, controller correction. And so is, at that point, you're not oscillating, so your derivative um, is also zero. Right, which means there's some external force that's acting right, onto the mouse itself, such that it's being pushed away from um, the correct value. But at that point, since the, the, since the error is constant, right, like, um, since the error is constant, um, uh, proportional doesn't ramp up um, to go back right, to account for this constant force. Um, I think um, it makes make a lot more sense with like, an analogy, right? Um, say, um, I'm going to use Kevin's analogy, so I'm credit to him. Um, say you're a car, right, and you're trying to drive straight on a line, right, but there's a really large wind that's blowing me off the sensor, right? So I'm going to read this error of a line, right? So with just P, this, uh, my, the correction that I make is, is, is a constant, right? So I'm going to spin this wheel um, a little bit faster than the other wheel to try to turn back in, right? But say the wind is strong enough so that even when I turn like this, I'm still being pushed out to the side. So I'm constantly trying to correct myself. But this wind is constantly trying to balance my, uh, trying to push me out, right? So you reach a point where the system is a balanced state, right? Because your correction doesn't change, and neither does the wind. So now you're constantly off-centered, but um, there is no other feedback that you're getting to, for you to tell me, OK, I need to spin this wheel even faster um, because the wind is pushing me off-centered, right? Does that kind of make sense? Right, so you can think yeah. of the only feedback you're getting is whether you're oscillating or whether you're wrong. But when the correction that you're getting from whether you're wrong is equal to you know, this external force, um, there's no other additional feedback that you're getting to tell you, OK, I need to fix myself even more, right? So yeah. Is the external force, that like torque or something? Or is that kind of um, see that? Yeah, something like slippage. Slippage, yeah. Um, you're constantly off-centered. And, I think that the, the problem you're going to face more often in micromouse rather than you know, wind is like you can't get that reading large enough. Um, or that difference is so small where you're not going to spin the wheel um, any faster, I guess. Or maybe like your wheel's positioning when you, saw it, when you programmed it on um, is a little off-centered. So um, when you spin this wheel a little faster, it makes sense to go straight even though it's not actually going. Right? Your wheel might be spinning faster. It doesn't mean that you're turning. That might be an issue. Yeah. Oh no, we were just talking about that. Like, for example, if your motors, if your, if your, your motors positioning is a little off, like say the, the geometry of it, is such that you're spinning one wheel faster equates to you moving straight, right? Um, your your wheel is spinning faster, so that 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 D controller or that P controller is kicking in, but you're not necessarily turning towards that answer. Um, that's the idea. Okay, so how do we solve this, right? So. Um, does anyone have an idea? It's, it's within the name itself. Integral, integral, integral. right? <laughs> All right, so what are you integrating at that point? Yeah. Right. So at that point, you can start integrating the error, right? Um, so what happens to the integration of that error? Add them. You want to go to zero. No. Increase it. It is remaining. So yeah, exactly, right? So 
if your substeady state error, right, going back to that graph, you have two lines, right? As time goes on, your integration increases, right? So that integration error, what can you do with that? All right, so that, that error is increasing, right? What are you going to do to your correction value? You cap by one proportion, great, by a pseudo proportional, so you can have like error so it can correct Yeah, so you're using that feedback of the increasing error from the integral to tell you, okay, I need to ramp it up. I need to ramp this correction value, right? So your P is not uh, ramping up because it's a constant error, right? So it doesn't say the same, so meaning that correction value isn't large enough, but because it can't go, it, it, the error doesn't change. Um, your P doesn't provide any uh, feedback, right? The derivative doesn't uh, provide feedback because you're in a constant state, right? So this I, right, is the only thing that's changing, right? The integral of the error is always increasing if you're off constant, right? Um, and be, when your I controller kicks in, that pretty much tells you, okay, um, as time approaches, the, the longer I am away from steady state, the larger this error, right? The larger this error means that the larger my correction value is, right? So now you have a complete PID, right? It's going to be P plus I subtract D. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. <laughs> you guess from one person. Yeah. Um, will it be zero? Yeah. So that's actually a caveat that you guys have to, to catch, right? Every so often, you're going to have to reset your integral to be zero, right? Especially when it's constantly positive. Else, you're going to overshoot, right? If, like going back to this guy. So right when error is zero, we get reset the control. Yeah, when the error is zero, you want to reset your, your i at that point, right? Else, that i is still positive, even though you're at the steady state. And if the i is still positive, it's going to go this way. But at that point, your integral is going to decrease, right? Because it's on the other side of the line right now. So yeah, you're going to get oscillation if you don't you know, reset your integral, but eventually it steadies out to correct value. All right, that kind of makes sense? Yeah. Yeah, but at that point, you're, you're hard coding this thing, right? What if the, the motor, um, like the, going back to the motor situation, right? Um, that's because you know it's the motor situation, and you can program like an offset to account for that, right? But what if that external force wasn't something that you know existed? That's the reason why you have the I. You're going to be doing PID <coughs> using your IRs as, as well. And what's going to happen is you're going to get different readings depending on what lights we're using. So it might not be the same from room to room. So you, it's not going to always fix your problems. Do you have a question? Uh, someone mentioned it. Uh, when the error is zero, essentially you're at that point, right? Okay. You're at the correct point. Your, your integral shouldn't be changing where your mouse is at that point. Um, that's one time you can do it. Though, um, if you didn't, right, it would be offset in the negative way, in which case your integral starts to decrease. So um, it kind of accounts for itself like that. All right, so each of these controllers are kind of the, controlled by, by a coefficient that we kind of mentioned, right? Like the uh, proportional coefficient, the integral coefficient, and the derivative coefficient, right? So think of those coefficients as scalars, right? Uh, as scaling um, how much uh, each of these uh, components matter, right? How much does the proportional error matter? How much does the derivative error matter? How much does the integral error matter, right? Those three kind of work together, and depending on which one you increase or decrease, it has a different effect on the system, right? Yeah, it's essentially. Error. So uh, just something to mention, Green um, uses PID for his mouse, except he controls that on his mouse itself rather than reprogram it. So if you guys want to, you guys can build like, that system. It's like an interface, so you can like change around his values. Okay, so like yeah, he uses the encoder the section. Dial. Yeah, the dial. All right, so right there. G C. This is just other graphs. Right, so this is talking about the PID uh, constants, coefficients, right? So yeah, you want to start off with just P and then slowly add in I and then account for everything in the end with, or sorry, start with P, 
then you smooth it out with D, then then you count for the, the shift in with I. So this is kind of like a summary of like what you should be changing your values. Um, it's just a reference chart, um, but I guess uh, kind of to test your your understanding, right? Can someone explain like uh, why, for example, uh, if you're overshooting, you should increase Ki? Well, actually, let's start a little bit easier. Um, you're, do you guys know what rise time is? <coughs> the time it takes to reach the, the the correct value, right? So if your rise time is really long, or is taking too long, what should you do to the uh, uh, proportional? Actually, if you want to um, increase your rise time, I should say. Oh, decrease it. Yeah, decrease it. Why? So it rise low, so it increases rise. Your correction value is less, even though um, your, your error is wrong, right? So which means it takes a longer time, right? Um, but if you're overshooting, right? Um, or if you want to solve overshooting, right? That's this, um, she. Yeah, if you make me slow, it overshoot less. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just use this graph as kind of reference for it. Um, right. That's okay. All right. So this is a GIF that he kind of. Posted where he changes each value of the coefficient. So yeah, he's changing p. He's changing the i. I. He's changing d. So what happens if you would only have i? Do you guys know what would happen? Oh, it just increasing, increasing, increasing. What it? It drives really slow until it reaches Yeah. Um, it would just oscillate, just keep oscillating, right? It would oscillate at that line, though, but it would just keep oscillating. What if your sine wave was really large? Uh, what if you had a sine wave that's really high frequency, right? Technically, your eye is suddenly really large, then really small, really large, really small. So your mouse is going to go like that the entire time. That's with just eye. Yeah. How about just D? Yeah, I won't do it. Yeah. <laughs> it just goes straight, right? Because yeah. it's. Yeah. 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 How can we have a graph this thing that's like we not gonna are we gonna use some software to have a graph it or just look by the eye? You're gonna look by the eye. You're gonna look by the eye, yeah. I mean, because you're you're trying to get real value readings. Like these are just models, right? He's get putting numbers in and simulating what it will look like, but you don't know what numbers you're reading. Yeah. Actually, that's not a bad idea. Um, so if, for example, you can use the raw data that you're reading when you're running your mouse, right? You can kind of see what values you're reading. Um, using that value, you can calculate the KPD, right? Once you calculate K, uh, KID or PID value coefficients, you can plug those numbers in. Once you get those numbers, you rerun it, get a new set of numbers, see how that looks like on the graph, and change the values accordingly. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah. With the encoders or with the IR? Oh, wait. The difference between encoders and the IR. Oh, no, 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 not the difference between the IR encoders. It would be like the difference between the two encoder counts, right? Oh, yeah. 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 You expect both encoders to be counting the same amount, right? Because every single tick is the same. If one wheel is spinning faster, you get more ticks on one side, which means that you're spinning one wheel faster, which is not good, which means you want to compensate for that by spinning the other wheel faster. Oh, so Okay. Um, what do you mean two sets? Oh yeah, so that means you can do a. Uh, there's gonna. Be, you're saying like uh, you get an error from your IR LEDs and your encoders, both. Right, you can sum both of them together, right? And your gyro. Yeah, there's actually, it's more than that. Um, all right, we're running a little bit short on time, but the rest of the lecture is essentially implementing um, PID with the encoders, which is gonna be your the rat assignment, right? You guys, you're trying to have it go straight in a line. 
applying PID. So that, that's what we we're mentioning, right? Encoders would just be a left encoder count minus right encoder count, right? Gyro would just be gyro read subtract the from the actual the original reading. Um, and then right there, uh, how do you combine the two errors? You can uh, linear relationship between all the errors, essentially. Um, which one you want to matter more? You just increase its coefficient. Um, it's not too important. Influencing PID control. Oopsies. All right. So here um, you have an interrupt. Right. You can have your encoder, uh, your PID uh, code run inside the interrupt so that it's guaranteed that every single time something changes. Or I think the stick is a clock, right? Or you can change it. Um, this interrupt runs, um, I think, like uh, depending on the clock. So every yeah. single certain amount of clock cycles. Uh, this interrupt uh, will be triggered. You said what? that the yeah. interval. You yeah. said the interval that Sysdic is called. Mm -hmm. One thousand. Yeah, and that guarantees that your PID code gets run every single time. So that's another place where you might use an interrupt. <coughs> Other than that, I think uh, this is assignment. Oh, I forgot. Yeah. All right. Uh, so for the right, you need to implement your PID and show us that you can travel six, uh, six cells. Without hitting any walls or basically going straight. Yeah. Um, and that you do that with just the encoders. Yeah, go ahead. So right now our doesn't have gyro. Yeah, so this yeah. one, that's why I only asked you to go straight. Um, because you can go straight with just the encoders. So what if your wheel is tilted and you have the same count? It's probably not going to be that tilted. So yeah, hopefully <laughs> not. Like, <laughs> if, it, if that's the issue, we'll see it. And if we see it, then we'll check you off. But the idea is that you can use just Coders. Um, once we talk about the IR LEDs, we'll expect you to incorporate IR inside your uh, PID. This, the idea of this is kind of like it's just a toy, uh, toy code that you can start setting up your PID framework for. Yeah. Your, most of your PID is going to come from your encoders. You'll uh, use your IRs to basically check every so often if you're getting too close. There's no mouse assignment, like I mentioned. Um, catch up, flush out your power systems, your encoders, your uh, motor circuits. Um, and then extra credit, you can read into the SCM uh, interrupt systems. It's kind of interesting. 